first of all, um, sincerely welcome to Melbourne. I'm happy. I, when I arrived here, it was Melbourne, and now it's Melbourne. <laughs> Melbourne, so, that's right. I'm getting there. Exactly. So um, you've been here for, what, 48 hours, perhaps, Jeffrey? Uh, not quite yet, but we're, we're working our way there. Okay. Well, we really <laughs> do um, appreciate you coming. I mean, it, the obvious joke, of course, is you've come from far, far away in order to be here, uh, and we really do appreciate you making the effort. Um, it, 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 is, it is a terribly long trip. Um, and of course you came here for the opening of the exhibition last night and uh, uh, lovely red carpet and a very full room. So just tell us, uh, are you happy with the exhibition? I'm, I'm thrilled. I mean, uh, I, I hope all of you get a chance to see it. It's, uh, um, I, I think it's uh, really amazing what a beautiful job of storytelling uh, ACME has done, that somehow or another they've pulled back the curtain uh, on what we do, how we make our movies, uh, some of the great artists behind it. And, um, you know, it, it, it really is um, an amazing celebration of what is probably the, um, on a scale, the largest collaboration that goes on in telling stories. We, um, each of our movies takes four or five, sometimes more years to make. Um, each film has 130,000 individual frames. Each frame travels through 12 individual departments. <laughs> Inside each department, each frame goes from between 10 and 100 iterations. And so when you do the math on that, uh, it's about 500 million uh, individual digital files that exist for each movie that we make. I don't know how we do it. I don't know how it, <laughs> it's just there's a magic to it that, you know, I still don't fully understand. But I have to say seeing the show here certainly makes uh, me appreciate it in a yeah. way that I, I, I really haven't. And uh, so they've done a just a spectacular job. And in particular, you'll hear this uh, conversation around this riding on the back of Toothless and sort of a revealing of the building of uh, the town of Burke. Yeah. And it really, it's just an incredible, it's a little four-minute film. It's beautiful, it's emotional, but it's also thrilling. And um, it's better than most theme park rides that my competitor spends $100 million building. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's in... Uh it's a 180 degree screen, isn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, when I was in there last night, um, riding the dragon, um, I was wondering whether that may be where cinema ends up going. Um, you know, the full that full 180 degrees is that a is that a possibility? Do you think? For the uh, future? First, well, I think so. I mean, I, anything that enhances what it means to you know have an exceptional experience in a movie theater is great, and that, in its own little way, yeah. I'm like you. I came away out of that just my mind racing with like, oh, so there's an opportunity here for us to do some things that we probably hadn't thought of before. Yeah. And uh, so, yes, I, I do think that you're seeing something pretty special. There's a theater in um, Los Angeles called the Cinerama Dome. Mm -hmm. Been around for some time that actually does do that, you know, kind of full screen. Fantastic. Yeah. And the other thing, just uh, the... the uh, opportunity to actually use the stylus if you like and get at, at the back there there's the screens and use the stylus in order to if you like get a sense for perhaps what it's like to work in a DreamWorks studio. Yeah well you can be an animator there's a great little program there and uh, that uh, you can have some fun with. Anyway it's an amazing exhibit and they did a beautiful beautiful job and um, you know I'm, I'm, I'm always someone who is so focused on today and tomorrow I actually never really take the time and look back, yeah, yeah. and uh, this was a chance to to do that in a in a remarkable way. So I I have to say, you know, I think maybe the nicest anniversary present I could have ever ever imagined was you know what Acme has done here uh, in this building. So uh, what a treat! Well, sincere congratulations too for twenty years. So uh, I'm a brand person, an ad person. We will not hold that against you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, that's a one step up from uh, agent. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> right. Correct. 
Now, <laughs> when I was... <laughs> when I... It, it's interesting. When I think about growing up, so I'm a, I'm a 60s child, there was there was actually no new animation to watch. I, was, I, I think the only animation I got to see, new animation I got to see, would have been the opening titles for a Pink Panther film. And then, all of a sudden, when I started having children, uh, your work at Disney started to hit the screens. And then, of course... I think Ants was the first the first DreamWorks film that I saw. Mm. Uh, the opening the opening sequence of Ants must have been a great thrill for you. Uh, certainly, as a as a viewer with a young daughter, um, it blew my mind. Yeah. But I'm imagining you know this film early early days in your new studio, and then all of a sudden you actually feel like you're going through the grass with Ants. Yes, must have been very exciting. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Now the logo. That's the brand thing. When, when I saw who the film was made by, it was the first time I'd seen that word. Uh, that word itself is incredibly evocative. But then uh, the very idea of the boy on the moon with the fishing rod, uh, it, just, it just struck me as just being so beautiful, so wonderfully powerful. Um, so how did that all come about? Oh, you know that guy Spielberg. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really? <laughs> right, okay. So well. the, boy, the boy on the moon fishing, uh, that was Stephen. I mean, he, uh, the, the name DreamWorks is something that Stephen and David and I actually worked on together. We were in one of our early, uh, you know, we had once, twice a week, the three of us would get together in those early days and, you know, have lunch and, you know, strategize on things and in one of those very very early uh lunch meetings we were given a zillion different titles and things to names to look at for for the company and um it was kind of like you know jigsaw playing on the table there and and we had words with dream and, and we yeah. had words with work and somehow or another we put those two together and that was the birth of DreamWorks. Stephen took it and actually designed the the logo itself mm. and uh so um you know that really was his baby well uh it is so evocative and so powerful but and then it makes me think about um jeffrey katzenberg as a child um and sort of dreaming and thinking about what he's going to do with the future I, i'm the movies that you enjoyed um when you were growing up jeffrey i think that you know we'd be interested to hear your faves Oh, and maybe gosh. some of your telly well, as well. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I'll just rattle off, you know, the ones that sort of come to mind of, you know, films that, um, you know, f I think the first animated movie I saw was Pinocchio. Yeah. yeah. Um, I remember, uh, I'm not, I'd have someone to have to go back and tell me the year, but I remember seeing Spartacus uh, as a movie on Broadway in a big movie theater. And then when I met Kirk Douglas you know, a number of years later was really quite an honor, and he ended up being an incredible influence for me in my life in a way that I didn't really, um, you know, see coming in any fashion, shape, or form. Gave me an amazing piece of advice. Um, and um, I don't know, The Graduate, The yes. Godfather. Fabulous. Bridge I read that you like Bridge, yeah, Bridge, Bridge, Bridge Over the River. Bridge Over the River, Kwai. Yeah. Well, almost everything David Lean did. Yeah. Lawrence of Arabia. You know, sort of Lawrence in Arabia and The Godfather to me are sort of the, you know, my, mm. my two most favorite films, I think. Um, uh, you know, then I think there are films closer to our times that I think have been, you know, two of Stephen's films in particular for me, I think were really extraordinary in that they made me have a greater appreciation of um, my parents, our generation, sacrifices that they made for us that I never really, I never really had a deep understanding of Saving Private Ryan, mm. you know, and yeah. my father and uh, his brothers all fought in the first, in the World War II, and, you know, you know, I was born in 1950, so I didn't hear that much about it. But I have to say, you know, my dad is still, you know, alive and healthy. And uh, but after seeing Private Ryan, mm. you know, it just it just made me have a understanding of what the generation 
before us yeah. did the level of sacrifice i think that's the thing that that film just struck me in a way that i i really yeah. was blown away and that's the power of movies schindler's list you know you know to understand you know the the, the you know the the challenge of people living in that time and the circumstances of it well, it does make me think about the opening sequence again so the impact of ants versus from the animation but the opening sequence of uh, sequence of Private Ryan, unbelievable, yeah. um, and then uh, Kung Fu Panda is really interesting. That the the fact that you've uh, it's 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 traditional art, is it not? At the opening and, sequence, and drawn animation, and then you yeah. move into yeah. so when he's dreaming, it's that's again that's just so. I suppose part of the trick of getting it right is getting that opening. So the people that you grab the people straight away, yeah, always for sure. Yeah, for sure. That's the beginning. That's the, you gotta, it's the roller coaster you ride. You got to take them up to the yeah. top before you <laughs> and then drop them. <laughs> <laughs> so when you were young, when you were uh, fishing off the moon, did you imagine that you'd finish up in the that the movie business was where you would make your life, Jeffrey? No, I started in. Uh, um, actually, very, very young age, and as a teenager, I worked for uh, the mayor of New York City, first when he ran for office in 1965 and 66, and then I joined uh, the administration as a gopher, but as, the, as I got older, I actually started getting some responsibility. I was the youngest employee ever on the payroll of the city of New York. Um, and uh, I moved, anyone surprised? <laughs> <laughs> I moved out of uh, uh, I graduated high school. I didn't go to college. Um, uh, I, I went to college for one day. Um, <laughs> right, <laughs> um, and uh, but you know, I was working and I and and in working, you know, in government and for the mayor, I, I every day was a was a, a college education for me, but yeah. it was, a, you know, it was the college of real life as opposed to sort of the, you know, um, sort of, you know, the, 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 the studying of, uh, you know, that you would have in a traditional um, uh, college experience. By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm not advocating it. It's just that's <laughs> the way it happened for yeah. me. My kids went to school and it was a college. It was a great experience for them. And yeah. Think very important for them in terms of how they grew up, but uh, I I didn't uh, uh, I found my way in the movie business completely by accident. It was not I wasn't a student of film. I I uh, I didn't have some deep personal connection. I went to movies as a kid, but uh, not beyond that. And um, uh, so in 1973, found myself working for. Barry Diller as his assistant, Gopher. At, at Paramount. At Paramount. Yeah. And that was really, I had a couple little jobs along the way to that, but that was the first real grown-up job. And so it, it, it's interesting, Jeffrey, because, of course, um, you're here. It's DreamWorks 20th. Animation's obviously a huge part of your your career. But it, it it's just certainly interesting for me when I have a look at what you are involved with when you were at Paramount. So um, Flashdance, for example. Yes. I mean, I think the people need to know these things. Um, an officer and a gentleman, yes, uh, and Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> so, so Jeffrey, that's not bad, is it? It's, so it's not just all about. Um, so tell no, us, I, tell us a little about those films and, uh, and that time. Well, I mean, it was a you know this was the sort of you know mid to late seventies, early eighties, um, very very different time in the movie business. Um, the um, uh, you know the studios were um, uh, becoming stronger again. Um, uh, the uh, types of films were um, uh, you know very diverse, and there was uh, much more personalization in terms of films and filmmakers and. Um, you know, these three kids walked in my office one day when I was at Paramount and projected a little film on my wall and talked about a movie called Zero Hour and how they wanted to make a parody of it, and that turned into Airplane. Yes, okay. The Zucker, Zucker, Abram Zucker. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, uh, I've always loved music and, and movies that celebrate music, and so, you know, Flashdance, Footloose, Grease. Yeah. You know, we made Grease during that time. Um, 
I met a very young, talented comedian who was on Saturday Night Live by the name of Eddie Murphy. <laughs> 48 Hours, Trading Places, Beverly Hills Cop all came out of that. Not bad, um, eh? uh, Barry Diller had a great relationship with, um, you know, I think one of the really most gifted filmmakers of that time, Warren Beatty. And so Heaven Can Wait and Reds. Reds, yeah. Um, Reds was um, fraught with danger. Was that, it, was very, it was expensive, wasn't it? Yeah, it didn't, very, it didn't very make expensive. Any money, I don't didn't, think. It wasn't very, no, but it's a remarkable movie. And yes. He is a brilliant, you know, brilliant, brilliant filmmaker, um, uh, Beatty, and he's actually shooting a film right now. Really? Uh, and it's doing a Howard Hughes story, and I'm, I'm excited to see what he does. Robert Redford did Ordinary People. One uh, of my favorites. Jim Brooks did Terms of Endearment. Um, Mary Tyler Moore. Uh, was it? He, yes, he did the Mary Tyler Moore show. Yep. He did Taxi, the TV series. Um, I wasn't really involved in the television business uh, that much at, at Paramount, but, you know, Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley <laughs> and uh, Taxi and, uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, Gary Goldberg uh, did... Um, Michael J. Fox. Come on. Anyone? Family ties. Family ties. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> so it was a it was a fan, it was a really remarkable a remarkable time and uh, you know I I it's where I learned the movie business. I was there from you know I arrived I was just uh, uh, just 23 years old just turned 24 and um, I was there for 11 years. Barry Diller was really one of the greatest bosses and for sure I think the most important mentor in my mm -hmm. career. He took this incredible interest in me and invested in me and moved me from department to department, you know, so that right. I really learned the business. Nobody does that anymore. Um, and, you know, so I worked in marketing and distribution and uh, went and worked in international and business affairs and, you know, and so finally, when I became president of the studio, um, uh, 80 something, one, two, I've lost track of the years there and that, they had actually really trained me to do the job. Yeah. And, um, and I felt like I could do the job. And uh, so, a, a, great, as a, exciting as a young times. man, as yeah. a 31, 32 year old. Man. Yeah. Old in the movie business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, then, but then of course, Michael Eisner, who was at Paramount, uh, and he went to Disney, and you went to Disney with him. Right. So what happened is, is Charlie, Charles Bluthorn, who was the chairman and founder of a company called uh, Golf and Western, which in the movies was always uh, parodied as in Golf and Devour. <laughs> uh, but he was this amazing, amazing, mad Viennese conglomerateur, and uh, he died very early, young man, and had a, a heart attack, and... Uh, this other guy came in and took over the company, and everybody hated him. So we all left. <laughs> and Diller went to Fox, and uh, Michael and I went to to Disney, and yes. um, you know that sort of started a whole new, you know, kind of decade of yeah. So it, it, is it true to say that when you arrived at Disney, um, the if you like the original heart and soul of Disney being its animation was nowhere near. Um, as successful as it, as it had been in the past. Well, that's kind. Um, <laughs> in fact, it was on his knees. That's the politic way to say <laughs> yeah. it. I, you know, I, think, I don't think anybody would disagree, but, you know, when we arrived in 1984, 84, 85, and that period of time was probably the lowest point in, which is why, you know, new management was brought in. You yeah. know, they had really kind of, the entire Disney brand had lost any real you know, values. And um, uh, it's interesting, my very first day of work, um, I went into um, uh, Michael Eisner's office. And so Michael was the CEO of the whole Disney company, and they made me uh, head of the Walt Disney Studio. So I was meant to look after movies and television and um, Disney Channel and all of home video and all of that stuff in this. And uh, I came in with my little buck slip on my first day and very excited and I had all these great things I wanted to go do and went in and I sat down with Eisner first thing in the morning and went through, you know, my to-do list and 
he said, fantastic, and, you know, just sent me off, and I got all the way to the door. <laughs> was it a long way away, the door from his desk? Yeah, he was at Walt Disney's <laughs> office, a big office. So <laughs> yeah. I made it all the way to the door, and I literally was just about out the door, and he said, uh, uh, Jeffrey, one, one thing I, I forgot before you leave. And I said, what's that? He said, uh, you know, come over here. I want to show you something. And we walked over to a window in the corner of his office and looked out the window, and he pointed to a building across the lot, and he said, you see that building over there? I said, yep. He said, do you know what they do there? I said, no, I have no idea. He said, well, you know, that's where they make the animated movies. I said, oh, that's nice. He said, and that's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I am telling you, uh, as, you know, I'm hard, you know, hand on the Bible, I, it is exactly my introduction to animation. I didn't know a thing about it. Uh, and uh, so... And there was a... There was a relation of Walt Disney's was in, still involved with the animation at that point. Is that right? Well, there was a son-in-law. That's what it was. Yeah. Uh, Ron Miller, who okay. had been running the studio. Mm -hmm. That's a term of art, running the studio. So <laughs> I get it. Wasn't <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in the animation studio of Disney, yeah. there's in effect not really much going on, is there? Well, they were finishing... Um, a a uh, movie called Black Cauldron, uh, and um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen Black Cauldron, but anyone? It's a oh, horrible a movie. Horrible movie. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I mean, it was it was like it was it was a group of people trying to like reinvent the brand and they thought the way to do it was yeah, to yeah. do something very aggressive and you know more adult and and you know i mean it was just a mess mm -hmm. and um so anyway you know uh and and i the one of the first things i did is is that you know uh i watched the movie and and uh you know just said my god we can't release this in this way <laughs> and so i had them bring the film to an editing room and you know, went and get an editor in there, and I started editing the movie. And honestly, and like guy. the entire studio went completely nut, I, crazy yeah. meltdown time. And I expect I that wouldn't this, have happened before. No, no. Well, just the idea of editing an animated movie. They yeah. said you can't edit an animated movie. I said, uh, yeah, you can. I'll show you. <laughs> and uh, just watch me. <laughs> <laughs> and and literally, I I I got this. So some, somehow or another, some executive producer called uh, Roy Disney, yes. you know, who called Michael Eisner, you know, who called me yes. and said, what are you doing? <laughs> he said, I'm trying to fix this piece of shit. What do you think? Of <laughs> uh, lovely. Uh, anyway, okay. there's no fixing it, let me assure you. So, so now was it? <laughs> Anyway, that was that was that was early on. <laughs> yeah. but, but then there was a big risk around who framed Ro Roger Rabbit. Yeah, that came a bit later. So I mean, basically, um, I uh, the very first thing I did was uh, uh, actually Michael and I did together. They pitched us the storyboards for uh, a movie that was uh, called The Great Mouse Detective, and it was actually quite charming. And uh, uh, two young filmmakers, Musker and Clemens, had been developing it and. Um, they had storyboarded the whole reel, but they hadn't put it in production. And, you know, we had a couple hundred people working there. And Michael and I walked out after seeing the storyboard pitching pitch of it. Which neither of us had ever been to a storyboard pitch of an entire movie before. It took two and a half hours. Oh, my goodness. Um, I was just trying to stay awake for the whole <laughs> yes. thing. And so, you know, so I go up with Michael to his office. He says, what, what, what do you think we do? I went, I have no idea. I said, what do you think we do? He said, well... We got a couple of hundred people and we're paying them every day. I said, well, we better, we might as well be paying them to make something to pay them to, to just sit around and do nothing. Yeah. And I said, okay, fair enough. So we made it. <laughs> and they did a really nice job. It was a pretty good yeah. movie. Yeah. You know, I have to say it was pretty charming. And by the way, those same guys went on to write and direct The Little Mermaid. Okay. Talented okay. guys. Oh, yeah. Um, and um, uh, so we... Um, I immediately uh, took, there was a, an idea that I had been working on to do as, an, as a live action movie at Paramount. I wanted to do a contemporary remake of Oliver. 
um, and to set it in New York City and Alphabet Town and do it as a as a musical. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I never really got started with it at Paramount. So I thought, okay, well, why don't we do that as an animated movie and do it with cats and dogs and do it, you know. Uh, and so we, we developed that. And that actually was the first movie okay. that um, really was sort of in our regime. And then I went and I got all these you know, uh, actors and musical acts and people that I had been friends with. So, you know, Billy Joel and Bette Midler and, you know, uh, <laughs> it was a, you know, it was kind of fun. And, and um, you know, it ended up going out and for the animation business there, it was the most successful original animated movie out of the Disney studio up until that time. Yeah. And, I don't know, maybe gross 50, 60, 70 million dollars was yeah. considered a hit. And but then we did Little Mermaid. Yeah. Roger Rabbit was a project that Spielberg had been developing uh, with a very very talented filmmaker Bob Zemeckis, and uh, which I thought was actually one of the most ambitious movies, mm. you know, uh, I had, had I had come across, and we which we made um, and uh, was a just a huge blockbuster yeah. disaster in the making of the movie. Probably went over budget more than just about any movie. There was um, a lot of budget pressure around that one, wasn't it? Huge. This, this isn't going to work. It's, yeah. And I think I'm right in saying that they said it had cost 50 and you got it down to 30 and it cost 50. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> um, and uh, then um, Beauty and the Beast, and the Aladdin, Beast. Lion yeah. King. Um, so just so. on Lion King, I just want to paint a picture to see whether this is right. Hmm. So... Um, so uh, I believe that Jeffrey Jeffrey only drinks Diet Coke or caffeinated mm. ca decaf Diet Coke. His meetings are only 22 minutes long, uh, and at 5 a 5 a.m. was something that um, used to used to occur in the Disney animated studios. I have this Im I have this image in my head that one day you walked into one of these meetings and said, "I've got this idea. Um, we're going into we're going to Africa." We've got a far, we've got a big, you know, Father King line. We're going to have a, he's going to have a baby. The baby, the boy's going to go away. Then he's going to come back. I need Elton John. I need Tim Rice, and we're going to call it Lion King. Is that, if I got that right, that's actually what Pretty happened. Pretty much nothing. <laughs> <laughs> the Diet Coke, the 5 a.m. coming in, pitching that idea that way. That's just about. You went for about 0 for 12 there. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, that's, but, what, that's the fantasy I have in my head. Yeah, no, it didn't quite work that way. But no. um, uh, So what do you want to know? <laughs> well, just, just the, the Lion, Lion King is, I mean, clearly as a franchise, if we can call it that, for Disney, an incredible success. And I just want the audience to know that Jeffrey Katzenberg is fairly fundamental, absolutely fundamental in the creation of that of that mega mega movie brand etc thank you um well it's uh just a little bit because i don't want to go too far afield here but um the lion there are two movies that um uh you know we've we've made i've been involved with over the years that um the the genesis of them were things that happened to me in my life uh, the Lion King is one, and interestingly, Madagascar is the other. Hmm. Um, and, um, you know, Lion King is, uh, the, the story of Lion King is a reflection of something that happened to me in my lifetime, in my young 20s, and, uh, uh, you know, when I was still in politics before uh, I had left um, politics to, to go into the movie business. And... Um, I, I thought the choices that I had to make for myself at that point in my life, which was about, you know, having to face the responsibility for things that I was involved in as opposed to running away from the truth. Mm. And, and I wanted to tell that story in a way because I felt it really was the defining moment for me of going from being a child to being an adult. Yeah. And, and I thought, well, that to me is a very pivotal life, a pivotal moment in life, something all of us have to go through. Yeah. Most people experience that moment, I realized, through one of two things, either the birth of a child, because when you have a, a child, you now have a level of responsibility that 
is unlike anything. You actually have a life mm. for many years that is so completely dependent upon you. And then that, that is, a, is, is something that is just like, it's unlike anything else that you, will, you, when, you, you can or will experience. And the second thing is the loss of your parents. Because once you lose your parents, you're no longer a child. You're no longer somebody's child. Yeah. And, um, and I think those are two very, very powerful things. And so I wanted to tell a story that really, in a great way, kind of tackled those two subjects. And that is, in fact, what Lion King does. You know, Simba, you know, in a very heart-wrenching way, you know, not only does he witness the loss of his father, but believes for a good period of time he's actually responsible for it mm. and he runs away mm. and uh, I was in a set of circumstances where I was told that I was responsible for something bad and I thought about running away and I ultimately decided mm, I, I didn't think I was res- I didn't think I was actually responsible for it and I was gonna stand up and defend myself and I wasn't going to run away yeah so when I watch Lion King, I see a different movie than you all see. <laughs> Although it's no wonder we all cry when we see it. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, and then um, I grew up not too far from the New York City Central Park Zoo. Hmm. And I used to go to the zoo as a kid, as a little, you know, five, six, seven-year-old. And I, I, uh, I love the zoo and I love the animals in the zoo. And they always seemed to me through my eyes as though they were treated you know, like they lived on Fifth Avenue and they're <laughs> yeah. every day I saw every time I went, they were always washing and cleaning out the zoo and their <laughs> cages were spotless and they were being fed, you know, the best steaks. And, you know, and I was just, I thought, wow, you know, these, they're living like high, time, you know, yeah. and what would happen <laughs> if these guys actually had to go back to where they where came, came from? from? How would they, how would that work out? <laughs> I wasn't thinking so good. Oh, exactly. <laughs> so I was sort of, the birth of sort of the, where those two came from. Fantastic. So, Jeffrey, you left Disney. Uh, I've got a little slideshow that we're going to go through. Um, you left You left Disney. Uh, that's well, that's a, a very kind way. Yeah, Why that, you that, just say, I was fired. You're, okay. Got the boot. You got, you were, yeah. It's a it's famous, famous story. Um, it's written up in... Infamous. Uh, infamous. Ugly. Written up in the Hollywood Reporter today, those of you that want to... Check out oh, the God. We have to relive this every ten years every or 10 twenty years. It's like every time there's an anniversary. Yeah. Oh, okay, it's twenty years you got fired. It was fifteen <laughs> years you got fired. Twenty five years you got fired. I it's remember like, reading Vanity Fair the year you got fired. And, I yeah. believe me. Yes, yeah. it's, it's good. I lived it. I don't need to reread it. Yeah, but did did you not say earlier it was wasn't a bad thing? Oh, it's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> Can I make a suggestion? It was the greatest thing that ever, ever happened because. You got to be in business with these guys. Is, yep. that, is that fair? I would say. Okay. So, um, yeah. So here's tell the, us here, about here. tell us right. about these. So guys. 1994, Steven Spielberg had just won the Academy Award for Schindler's List, it's okay. and he put out Jurassic Park. <laughs> so, like in our world, he had both the Academy Award and what we call the Bank of America Award, <laughs> all in one year. That's going pretty Hard well. Hard to be doing any better than that, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. He's always been the king, but like, he was the, like, that was like the, yeah, anyway. So Geffen sold his record company for like the fourth or fifth time for another billion dollars, <laughs> right? And I got fired. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm out of a job, you know, being literally dragged through the gutters of, Hollywood Boulevard. It was you know, a fascination. Oh, ugly. It was, you know, just the worst things, you know, being written and said. And, you know, I had this lawsuit. It was just super nasty and yeah. really, really, you know, ugly. So I trade one third of me for Steven Spielberg and one third of me for David Geffen. So who got the better of that deal? It's, it's not a bad, it's not a bad deal. And, and when I first saw that DreamWorks logo uh, and then the S, the SKG under that, you know, and I was—it it fascinated me straight away. So, it was just a lovely, beautiful little touch there, in that um, movie goers could be confident in what was actually being produced. I think immediately, um, and of course, then you went on and produced some pretty awesome stuff. Now, I'm going to continue on my slideshow. 
Go for it. There oh, look, he is. Go back that picture. That looked pretty yeah, good yeah. there. It's a great picture, isn't it? So I was just thinking about Disney. Uh, now, I know Walt, Walt Disney, um, you didn't meet Walt, but I know you've always, you talk about mentors in your life and the importance of, of Walt and, yeah. uh, and going into his archive, finding out how you know, they went about making, the, making uh, animated movies. It does strike me that Shrek is almost the 21st century's Mickey Mouse. Um, do you see him that way? Well, I don't think I get to say that or feel that. I think that's other people. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, in in China they think it's Poe the Panda. So you know, yeah, that's on where you, you got go. You more than one. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, Shrek uh, came at a just a, a critical time for our company in so many different ways. Um, when when we started DreamWorks, and very specifically the animation business, you know, because I worked at Disney for 10 years, I loved the, being there, I loved every day I was there, I loved the people and the movies that we made. I loved Walt's heritage, I learned the animation business from him, even though, as you said, I never actually met him, I threw his work and his archives. Um, he had this amazing mission statement, which just every day was like, the North Star for me and for everybody in this company said, I make movies for children and the child that exists in all of us. Hmm. And it's just such a pure and simple uh, phrase and one that, you know, is just, you know, every day to remind yourself, what are you, what, what, what are we doing? What are we in pursuit of? And so when I got to DreamWorks, I didn't, you know, and I don't know how much of this was my ego, which I have a big ego, um, I don't know how much of it was my competitiveness. I'm really, really competitive. <laughs> um, uh, but I didn't want to do what Disney did. Yeah, I did it. I knew how to do it. I was good at it. I wanted to find our own path. I wanted us to be something that someday would be its own set of values. And uh, I didn't realize how hard that was you know I knew I, I knew it was important to me I, I again one of the things I came to appreciate so much during those ten years at Disney but certainly the last five years there is is that having a brand where it is more valuable than even the sum of its parts yeah and and so I I thought wow wouldn't it be amazing if someday we could have a brand and I never said that out loud because. It was such an audacious, just starting, a, the first studio in 65 years was nuts. Then starting an animation studio was crazy. And then if I actually had ever said out loud, oh, and we're going to try and have our own brand, yeah, they just would have locked me up. So, <laughs> um, you know, we began what was, to me, our, our what I consider the R&D years of DreamWorks in which we were trying to find ourselves and our path and what it might be. So we started out by making an incredibly dramatic movie, The Prince of Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, there was, and part of the reason why I was excited about making that movie is, is there was nowhere on this planet would anybody ever confuse that with a Disney film. You know, they were never gonna take on telling a story about the Bible, you know, a Bible story. And, um, uh, so in some ways, again, it was a modestly successful film, but I thought, you know, part of our discovery. Then we made, uh, a very sophisticated New York City comedy, Ants, yeah. with, you know, with Woody Allen. Um, uh, once again, a, a very different kind of movie, something, you know, Disney would, would, would never do. We made a satirical movie, Chicken Run. You know, with 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 Ardman, Great and then you. you know, all of these were like if you if you think about it, they are all sort of like um, we're trying to find our path, and these are the footsteps along the way to f getting to a a place. Then in two thousand and one, the big green ogre shows up. There he is. And that's it. And that is the defining moment. It's the moment when we found who we are. Yeah. We found our North Star. We found our mission statement. And is it this, uh, I've heard this phrase, it's, the fun, it's appealing to the adult in the child. Well, what, so my, and I say this with a wink and a nod to Walt Disney, we make movies for adult 
and the adult that exists in the child. Yeah, yeah. And can you give us an example maybe of a, of a scene where that's absolutely best expressed? Uh, well, <laughs> or just the whole film. You know, <laughs> no, well, I actually probably, and you can go downstairs and see it because mm. it is just, it's an amazing moment. There's a, a, one of our great board artists and ultimately directors at DreamWorks, an artist by the name of Conrad Vernon. Vernon. And uh, Conrad is the gentleman who not only invented um, uh, the uh, uh, gingerbread cookie, <laughs> but he actually does the voice. Okay. Not the buttons, not the dream, you know, the, not the, my buttons. The torture but scene. If you, yeah, so think about that scene in the prison with Farquaad. And <laughs> if you go downstairs here, there is, they've, filmed the original storyboards <clears throat> performed by Conrad as he did it for us. Yeah. When we, the first time I sat in a room and he, and I had no idea, and he performed that scene, and you, it's what, and we made it. It's cool. And, you know, that's not, you know, that's not Disney talking there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, is it? So this is, it's beautiful there. So this is this is the gates, I presume, to into yeah. the studio. Mm -hmm. um, this is where you all work. Um, I believe that the culture at DreamWorks is uh, where well, you work hard at the culture. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we wanted to um, build a, again a, a place where we would attract the most talented artists and technologists, since we are in a technology business, um, from all over the world. And um, we wanted them to have um, a place where they love their work, they love coming to work, and they are uh, honored and recognized and acknowledged for the uniqueness of what they do. Mm. And so making DreamWorks one of the best companies in the world to work at has been a goal uh, for the leadership of our company from, from day one. And so many of the things that Silicon Valley is actually doing today are things that we were doing 20 years ago, you yeah. know. And um, and so we are constantly doing things. I mean, the campus itself is a really, you know, you, you have to see it to understand and feel it and believe it. But you walk on it, and within a minute, you realize it's such a um, an incredible vibe in the place, and it's very beautiful, and it's landscaped, and there's you know, water fountains and, you know, I mean, you know, uh, 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 different fountains and, and uh, little streams and koi ponds and yeah. flowers Beautiful. and trees. It's just, it, it, because that's what inspires artists. Yeah. You know, that's what makes them. And so, you know, most of the day they're spent staring at their computer screens. And so I want to make sure that when they're not locked in their office working super hard, when they come out, there's something that's beautiful for their spirit and their eyes and their soul. Hands up who wants to work there. Uh, so there's, uh, and you're also in India now and China. Um, and is that about being able to, in effect, work on film 24-7 so you can pass files around? No, nope. not, no, not at all. I mean, <clears throat> we have a, you know, our headquarters is in uh, Glendale, um, uh, California, and... Uh, we have a, another studio in Silicon Valley because, again, there's a lot of great talent there. Um, we, we went to Bangalore in, in particular because in order for us to be able to scale the size of our studio, we actually needed uh, more talent. And, and rather than um, uh, trying to mine that talent in the places, because we already are a constant hire and recruiter in the place we were, we wanted to find a new place for talent. And Bangalore, there are two million college graduates uh, with degrees in computer science uh, working at various companies. And our bet is, is that there were three or four or 500 of those kids who actually wanted to be artists more than they wanted to be just engineers or, you know, um, you know, doing various outsourcing things because yeah. there are many, many companies, big companies 
you know, have big operations there in this. And it turned out to be true. And so it's not, we don't go there because it's cheaper to work. We went there because we found a whole new source of very, very ambitious, young, creative talent. Yeah. Will we continue the slideshow? We're nearly up to Q&A time, Jeffrey. Okay. Uh, your, phone, just, your phone been lighting up? Uh, it's been lighting up, yeah. Uh, I just want to make sure that the audience are aware that you're, um, you are, have been called a kingmaker. Um, you're heavily engaged with the Democrat, Democratic Party. Um, wag the dog. I was thinking about Wag the dog. I was wondering whether you're Robert De Niro or... <laughs> <laughs> do you remember that film? I do. Yeah. <laughs> do we go there? Yeah. But, well, tell us what you do for the Democrats. Um, well, I, you know, I've been involved, as I said, going, I started when I'm in politics when I was 15 years old. I believe, you know, participating in politics and in government um, in some kind of um, uh, social service is a, is is a, both an opportunity and I kind of feel an obligation, hmm. and um, and so I have stayed active in politics my uh, my whole life and. Uh, um, you know, I uh, I find candidates that I believe in, and and then I do what I can to support them. Certainly, in the last twenty years, that support has been, you know, mostly focused on being able to raise money uh, for them. And uh, you know, I met Bill Clinton when he was a young governor in Arkansas um, before he ran for president, and. You know, was uh, you know one of his I don't know top two or three or four uh, fundraisers for him. I yeah. met uh, Senator Obama, um, uh, and uh, was so impressed and taken with him mm -hmm. and who he was as a person and his values, and uh, really urged him to to run for president and told him I would support him if he did and mm -hmm. have and. You know, uh, um, so I, I'm, you know, I'm full in right now. I'm Fabulous. very, very focused on who the next president is in, in our country. I think that this next election in 2016 will be literally the most important election of my lifetime. And um, I'm deeply, deeply concerned about how divisive the country has become and how uh, money has really hijacked the political process in a way that you know, I, I find reprehensible and, and incredibly distasteful, but unfortunately it is now the law of our land. And, you know, mm. I, the only thing I know how to do is fight fire with fire. So they're going to have a ton of money. We're going to have a ton and a half of money. Well done. Well, we wish you all the best. So, um, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's, let's say it's the 40th anniversary of DreamWorks. They're 3D glasses, I think, yeah? Um, it's the 40th anniversary of Dream. So, just a bit of you know future thinking. What what do you think the shape of the business will be at that point? Uh, well, I don't know. It's hard for me to tell you what's going to be in three weeks, let alone 20 years. Um, uh, I'll tell you where I think the movie business evolves to in the next 10 years. Okay. Um, I think that we're going to move to a, a place where You'll go to movie theaters for uh, exceptional, um, really great theatrical experiences. Giant screens, beautiful presentation, great service. It's a night out. It's a, it's a, it's a premium, exceptional um, experience. Something not replicatable in your home. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, you know, there is something that a communal experience of getting hundreds of people into a movie theater and sharing that experience, it amplifies in a wonderful, wonderful way movies. And we make them for that. You know, I, I, I often talk about, you know, people ask me, why do you, you know, what is it about movies? Why do you, why are you so passionate about it? Why, why are you so excited about movie making? And I'll tell you because, you know, I think about, I'll ask a question of, for you to, of you, the members of the audience here, which is I'm going to ask you just for take one second and think about 
what is the most beautiful thing in the world for you? And children and uh, uh, spouses and pe- take that off the, that's not, that's Something not else. a sit, right. So that, take that out, take, you know, relationships and just say, what is the most beautiful thing in the world to you? Is it a place? Is it a painting? Is it a piece of music? Is it, you know, the Taj Mahal and, you know, it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen before. Is it nature? What is it that is beautiful for for you? Some great, you know, resort that you've gone to, you know, a dive on the Great Barrier Reef. I don't know. You know, there are many, many things that people think of. I will tell you what is the most beautiful thing in the world for me. Laughter. And in particular, <laughs> the laughter of children. I just, I don't think there's anything more beautiful. That's the business I'm in. Mm-hmm. We make movies, and the objective of those of our movie making is to entertain and to enlighten, but most of all is to bring laughter to all of you. And so coming into a movie theater, laughter is contagious, and it's where our movies play at their very best. It's not to say you can't enjoy them at home. So 10 years from now, movies will come into movie theaters, and they'll be exclusive in movie theaters. My guess is... Two weeks, a little bit, three weekends, something like that. You know, 15 days, 17 days, something like that. (laughs) And then after that, movies will be available everywhere to everyone on the planet. And you will pay for the movie based on the square inch. So the bigger the screen, the more you pay for it. (laughs) So if you watch it on a... You know, projection in your home, you'll pay $12. You watch it on a 70-inch, 75-inch TV, you'll pay six ninety-five. You watch it on this, you'll pay $1.99. People will pay for this, not based on windows of availability. Based on inches. But on the size of the screen, meaning the quality of the presentation that yeah. you see. Got it. Please thank Jeffrey Katzenberg. Okay. Way over time. We're way over time, Jeffrey. Now I'm just going to scroll through these texts, and so while I'm why I'm doing that, so we'll be speed answering. Uh, speed yeah, we're questions, absolutely speed answering. Uh, okay, we're speed answering. Absolutely. <laughs> um, does DreamWorks do any research into linking their movies with young children's connection to animals and wildlife? Uh, yeah, on uh, m- most of our movies. So we've done a big program in Madagascar in terms of uh, environment there and uh, supporting the uh, 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 ecotourism, which is, uh, frankly, one of the best ways to protect wildlife today. We have a big uh, program with Conservation International in preserving the pandas in their natural habitat in China. And so... The answer is yes, pretty much every movie that we've made that has some connection between, and again, if you think about it, so many of the movies I've been involved with in my career are inspired by nature. And so I have a deep love and passion and commitment to doing everything I can to help preserve it. With the coming of VR, with the coming of VR, do you see films being able to leverage the technology? Um, I'm... I'm curious about it. I mean, I have seen, you know, the all the latest things. Oculus Rift, which is the newest one, we are actually, uh, we've actually built a little four-minute experience film uh, uh, using that technology, so we're leaning into it. Um, I'm not quite sure what the, um, what, you know, how it's going to translate. Um, I, I, I sure don't understand how somebody paid $2 billion for it, but... Uh, I'm, <laughs> yeah. you know, he's a smart man, Mr. Zuckerberg. So I'm, I'm yep. sure he's got some big plan for it. It just escapes me yet. My daughter says hi. Hi. Um, nice. Uh, uh, a, a we son, better get a selfie for her. Yeah, a, a, son, a son, Louis says, "Where's your, where's the DreamWorks building?" The DreamWorks building uh, is in uh, Glendale, Cal- beautiful downtown Glendale, California, um, which is um, just. Uh, just down from uh, Burbank, where Warner's and Disney and right. all of them. So we're we're all part of the family. We're, we're all sort of in yeah family. in 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 within a couple of miles of one another. The advice Kirk Douglas gave you. Ah, Kirk Douglas 
uh, who was a tr- tremendous philanthropist, and he was making a movie for us at uh, Disney with his last movie that he made, Tough Guys, with Kirk, uh, with Burt Lancaster, the last movie the two did together. And um, I, I walked in one day on uh, Kirk during his lunch hour. He was, I don't know, 76, 78 years old when we were making the movie, and lunch hour, I wanted him to rest. And... Uh, <laughs> I uh, walked in his trailer and he had all these engineers and construction people in the trailer. And, you know, when I got there and he chased them out and I said, what are you doing? And he said to me, well, you know, my wife and I, we've been, you know, for years working on this program in which we're trying to rebuild the school yards of every inner city school in Los Angeles. And uh, they had done about 50 or 60 at the time and there's several hundred and you know he was he wanted in his lifetime to do them all and and uh so i was uh, incredibly impressed not the least of which is is that he's never taken any public credit for doing this he was just and i said to him so i just i I have to ask you a question you know why and he said to me i'll tell you why so here are the words you have not learned how to live until you have learned how to give and i thought wow those words Coming from Spartacus, you listen. <laughs> um, and we've got a thanks. Um, girl in pink at the top front. Kirk was my question. No problem. Girl in pink at the top. Um, what do you think of the Kardashians? I don't. Ah, <laughs> why don't why don't some Americans uh, like Obamacare? They don't understand it. Uh, um, how much room is there in Hollywood for animated film to be made specifically for adults and for animation to be treated less as a genre and more as a medium to tell any type of story? Well, it's there for someone to go do it. Um, you know, you have to do it on the right economics. Certainly that is the industry that exists today very successfully in Japan. You know, there are R-rated animated movies and you know, uh, PG-13 yeah. animated movies. And, yes. you know, so there's a, a, a very diverse animation business in Japan because somebody did it. So someone will come along and do it in Hollywood. Why did you get fired from Disney? Well, here's an interest. I'm not sure. I, I, <laughs> he, he, You're still trying pro- to work it out. Well, yeah, <laughs> I'm not, actually. No, I, no. I, I've, I've moved well beyond it. I... Uh, <laughs> So here's an interesting thing. In the summer of 1994, the number one movie in the world was The Lion King. The number one show on Broadway was Beauty and the Beast. The number one best-selling, the number one television show in America was a show called Home Improvement, produced by the Walt Disney Studios. The number one book in America was actually based on that TV show called Tool Time. The number one soundtrack, number one record in the world was the soundtrack for The Lion King. The number one video game uh, was a Lion King uh, video game. So pretty much anything that you want to think of in the world of uh, art or creative or storytelling, the Walt Disney Studio at that moment in time literally was the top in every single one of those things. I don't know that it happened before. I don't know that it's ever happened again. What I do know is I got fired. fired. (laughs) (laughs) So the, the, everyone here would have seen the Jerry Maguire film. So there is the, there's the opening, there's the famous memo. Now there is a story where you, you, there was a famous memo in real life. Yes. Which then apparently was the inspiration for the Jerry Maguire memo. Is that correct? Yes. (laughs) <laughs> so, tell us a little about that. That sounds okay. fun. Okay. In 1991, um, during Christmas holidays, for 25 years um, uh, at Christmas time, my wife and my twins and I went to uh, a uh, hotel resort in uh, Hawaii, in Honolulu. We, were, we had the same room for 25 years. We had the same table for breakfast every day. We, <laughs> same waitress for 25 years. So. <laughs> Sat on the same piece of little sand for 25 years. Uh, in 1991, uh, one of those 25 years, it rained for 11 days. <laughs> and that was really bad because I was locked in my hotel room for 11 days with, you know, uh, my kids. And so I, I, wrote this, <laughs> I wrote this memo about the movie business and yeah. what, what I thought it needed to be better at. 
Okay. And and uh, it, it was quite a missive. It was 19 pages long, so it was I was really bored. <laughs> and um, anyway, I came back and I I uh, I shared the memo with um, Michael Eisner and uh, the staff of the movie company at Disney at the time. And, you know, this is long before there was an internet or I think maybe we had faxes then. I'm not sure. I was, you know, it was the time of that. Anyway, the memo was leaked and, uh, and became quite a contretemps in Hollywood and the Hollywood, uh, I guess, variety for the first time in its history reprinted the entire memo, all 19 pages of it. Uh, I do need to see that. Well, I'm sure you can. I, you I know, everything is available. You yeah. go search that, and I'm sure I that piece of crap is available really. too. So <laughs> nothing disappears anymore. That's the lesson in, yeah, exactly. in the world. Except every, every kid, everybody footprint. knows that today. Yeah. Um, DreamWorks is theme parks. Mm-hmm. Um, this is trick. You're doing some... Well, we have a number of things we're doing. We've done modest uh, attractions. We we actually at DreamWorld here on the Gold Coast, we actually have uh, three attractions within the, the park there. They've done a beautiful job with it. Um, and, uh, you know, we have some Madagascar attractions at different places around the world. But we are, we've been well into developing what we believe is what could be a new type of dream, a new type of theme park experience, and it's basically uh, uh, indoors. So the entire park is contained in a million square feet, <laughs> and uh, uh, we're um, we're we're literally ninety days away from the finished design of it. We've been working on it for a year and a half, Fabulous. and I have to say, it's really. It's unique. It's beautiful. Um, it's really expensive to build, and I'm sure we'll find somebody to put it in Sydney Harbour. Fabulous. <laughs> uh, I think we, it, we're uh, 20 minutes over here, Jeffrey. It's a lot yeah. of fun, though, isn't it? Yeah, uh, we'll start sort of winding it up. This is a really, you know, what, what's your advice for people starting their company for the first time? Uh, well, you know, you have to be... You know, you have to be bold. You have to be confident. You have to be. Uh, you you have to believe in yourself. You know, I, I find you know often that. You know, when I, I'm when I when I meet young people who are starting out. You know, I I I always sort of think about you know that if you don't if you don't believe in you, why should I believe in you? And. You know, I think it's very, very important for people to find what is that something about them that, you know, they, I, everybody has something special. Everybody. I really do believe that every human being has got some something that makes them mm. unique, that makes them special. And finding that special thing, you know, is part of growing up. And, you know, um, and it's not always about work that's that special thing. You know, it can be about generosity. It can be about what you do for others. I, there's just many ways in which you can be special. Um, I, I will tell you the thing that, uh, uh, you know, I, I discovered, you know, later and in, 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 in recent years, you know, just in terms of my own most important uh, uh, ambition or, or mantra or something that I, I try and aspire to every day in what I do. And, and it's, 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 very, it's sort of very straightforward and obvious, but if you actually drive at it consciously and think about it, I think you'll find enormous, enormous rewards that come from it. And it's very simple. Exceed expectations. And exceed expectations in, in as many different aspects and ways of your life. It's, it, it goes beyond the simple notion of, well, I came in here today, and I actually have that thought before I get on stage. I really want to see if I can exceed your expectations. I don't know what you were thinking was going to happen when you came in here or what you were going to hear from me, but um, you know, I try and give it a... 110 percent and I don't always succeed you know and you 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 know and, and that's not that that isn't that shouldn't be the 
you know, that should be the aspiration of it, but just the fact that you think about it and you attempt that and that more often than not you do. So I can tell you in your jobs that you have, uh, you know, if you think about what your routines are and what your responsibilities are, I guarantee you that if you consciously work to try to exceed the expectations of who you are working for and the work that you are doing, you will win. Mm -hmm. yep. And I will tell you, you can apply that to almost every facet of your life. Friendship. I think people don't often give enough value or importance to what it means to have a friend. And so for my friends, I actually work at trying to be a better friend to them than they might be to me. It's, mm. not, it's not a contest. It's just I want to exceed their yeah. expectations. I think about it in philanthropy. Um, I actually think about, you know, I've been happily married to an amazing woman for 39 years. Mm. You know, that's a challenge to exceed her expectations. <laughs> that's... You know, it was her birthday last week, and I, somebody said, what are you doing for her birthday? I said, I'm, i got to go exceed her expectations. I'm, it's a challenge in it. But I do. I don't take her for granted. She's just a remarkable and very amazing woman, and I don't ever want to. So by, by thinking, you know, by having that as a sort of a, a, of a, of a, a mantra to live by, I just feel like you will be constantly rewarded for doing it. If we could just have the final slide that I had there with Jeffrey and his and the Oscar, if we can just go back to that one, I just think it's very important that uh, uh, it's not a surprise, is it, anyone, everyone, that Jeffrey's uh, holding on to that that gold statue. Um, we really sincerely thank you very much for your time, Jeffrey. It's been fantastic. I hope you've all enjoyed it as much as I have. <laughs>